Thank you. Okay. Good morning, yeah. good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Ira Mangunay Calvadores, and I am the coordinator of York University Mitigation Engagement Response and Governance Institute, or the YEMERGE. I would like to officially open the second session of Emerging and Systemic Risk Monthly Lecture Series, co-organized by uh, YEMERGE and CIFAL York by reading our land acknowledgement. York University recognizes that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tikarado has been taken care of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current um, treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. With this, I would like to ex express my very warm welcome to our directors, moderators, speaker, and respected participants all over the world. Without further ado, I now would like to hand the session to the un uh, University Distinguished Research Professor, the Director of the York Emergency Mitigation and um, um, Engagement Response and Governance Institute, of York University, Director Jihan, Jian Hong Wu. Thank you, Ariel. Good day, Professor Jennifer Spinner, uh, and our moderator of today's lecture, and our distinguished speaker today, Professor Afshin Reza. And a good day to everyone. I'm Jian Hong Wu, the director of the Y Merge, or the York Emergency Mitigation, Engagement, Response, and Government Governance Institute. I'm very pleased that the Y Emerge is organizing this monthly lecture series on emerging and systemic risks. This is in collaboration with the CIFA York and the Disaster and the Health Urban Systemic Risk Transformation Cluster, or the DUSER. Y Emerge is a Pan University Research Center is created to build on York's exceptional expertise to develop, grow, and sustain transformative and multidisciplinary research and uh, teaching in transformative disaster risk reduction, emergency preparedness, response, and recovery. This monthly lecture series is a very important platform for us to bring together a wide variety of disciplines to disseminate frontier research in key issues on emerging and systemic risks. The DUSER cluster is funded by York University's Vice President of Research and Innovation and compri comprised of uh, seven thematical subclusters. So the choice of the issues and the speakers of this lecture series reflect the thematical research areas. CIFA York is part of this lecture series, uh, is part of the uh, UNITAS Global Network of Training Centers for Knowledge Sharing, Training and the Capacity Building for Leaders, Local Authority and Civil Society. We established in 2020 is the partnership between UNITA, York University and York Region CIFA York is working with YEMERGE to expand the global experience and network. And this collaboration includes this monthly lecture series. So with that, I'm very uh, pleased to present to you the moderator today, Dr. Jennifer Spinner. Uh, she is a system professor in York University's Disaster Emergency Management Program. She is a member of the executive community of Y Emerge and she is leading one of the medical projects within the Institute. She studies various connections between groups of people living and working at the intersections of environment society, particularly extreme weather hazards and disasters. So this position her extremes well for uh, moderation of today's lecture. So Jennifer, Professor Spinner. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Wu. Uh, my name is Jennifer Spinney, and I appreciate the introduction. Dr. Zare, today's speaker, though, deserves uh, all of the attention. 
Um, he, uh, we're very lucky to have Dr. Zari here talking with us about solar storms and their impacts on society and technological systems. So I'd like to share just a little bit about Dr. Zari. Dr. Zari is an associate professor in the electrical engineering and computer science department at York University here in Toronto, Canada. He joined York University about five years ago in 2017 um, in the Power and Renewable Energy Systems Group. But before joining York, Dr. Zari worked with Hydro One Networks um, Inc. in Toronto, Ontario, um, in multiple departments, uh, including special studies, transmission systems planning, and transmission reliability and performance analytics. When it comes to solar storms, Dr. Zari has developed um, a special area of expertise. He's been working on various research and development projects for many years, about a dozen years since 2010, and has developed several models and techniques for the analysis of phenomena and their impacts on technological systems, especially power systems. At Hydro One, he was one of the main developers of the first real-time solar storm monitoring and computation tools which is currently the reference of operator action in the Ontario Grid Control Centre. He has also been the chair and active member of collective IEEE and CIGRE working groups and tasks for task forces on solar systems. And hopefully Dr. Zari can spell out those acronyms for us. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Sari is a professional engineer in Ontario and also an associate editor of um, the IEEE Transactions on Power Delivery and IEEE Power Engineering Letters. So again, Dr. Sari, hopefully you can spell out those acronyms. Without further sure. ado, please uh, just pizzazz us all with your discussion on solar, solar storms and their impacts on society. And okay, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for uh, and welcome to this presentation. And thanks a lot, Dr. Espinu, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, it's basically, uh, let me uh, start with sharing the screen. And uh, yeah, uh, so the solar storm, uh, and the effects on the society and technological system. So this phenomenon basically, uh, as the obvious from the name, uh, is uh, coming from the sun. So first of all, let's see uh, what type of solar storm we have, basically. And uh, these are the four main types of uh, the solar storm, starting with the solar flares. Uh, Solar flares are a large, uh, basically a series of large explosion uh, in the sun's atmosphere caused by tangling, crossing or reorganizing uh, of magnetic field lines. And they are based of uh, electromagnetic radiation. And because this is the, a type of radiation, uh, it travels with the speed of light. And uh, as you know, the light uh, takes about eight minutes or so to reach Earth. And this is the speed of solar flares as well. Uh, the next type, which is uh, going uh, more intense and more important, at least in terms of storm that we are talking about, uh, it's called coronal mass ejection. Uh, coronal mass ejection is a massive burst of plasma from the sun, sometimes associated with solar flares. And the next one is geomagnetic disturbance, which is also known as geomagnetic storm. And this one is generated by the interaction of the sun's outburst with the earth magnetic field. It's basically CME and the magnetic uh, field of the earth. When they interact, uh, they create a geomagnetic disturbance. And the last one is solar particle event. So let me... Turn this on, maybe it's better now. Uh, solar particle events, which is also known as solar energetic particles, uh, mainly include protons, electrons, and heavy ions with high energy in the range of some kilo electron volts to uh, mega and even giga electron volts. So they are very powerful particles uh, that uh, again come from sun. And uh, the history, let's say, in the present day, uh, 
uh, of geomagnetic disturbance and the uh, attraction toward this topic started from basically a report which is uh, issued and presented to, to, uh, to the basically uh, US Senate and uh, Homeland Security around 2008, 2009. Before that, of course, geomagnetic disturbance was known, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they couldn't get, basically get this much attention uh, like today. And this report basically studied the effect of geomagnetic disturbance, the strong one on the uh, US uh, power grids. And the area that you see here are the areas uh, that will be the most vulnerable parts of the US. Uh, and if the strong uh, storm happens, they all go to blackout without power for a long time. And at the time, they compared this basically a storm with the existing at the time, the events that they had before, uh, like this one, for instance, the blackout of 2003, uh, which uh, basically Toronto also was a part of that blackout. It happened in 2003, and the estimated cost for that blackout was about four to ten billion dollars. The damage cost. Uh, the next one also, which is uh, just before 2008, I guess it happened. It was Hurricane Katrina, and the cost estimated due to that was 81 to 125 billion dollar. And uh, when this study compared and uh, estimated the cost due to a severe geomagnetic storm, they found out that the cost will be something around, let's say, or between 0 0.6 to 2.6 trillion dollar. And this is only in the US, not worldwide and other countries. Uh, and the full recovery, which is also very important, is that take uh, four to 10 years. And at least for the early a couple or three weeks of the after a storm, there is no power. And you can assume that when we have one day out of power, we have a lot of headache. And if we don't have power for two weeks, three weeks, you can imagine what will happen. This one uh, caused basically the US regulatory body and the Senate, et cetera, to uh, get worried about the consequences if happens, etc., and uh, this is why a U.S. Uh, Department of Energy uh, and a, uh, especially Federal Energy Regulatory Body of that, which is called FERC, uh, first of all, it started the discussion with the utilities, and uh, they sent uh, some questionnaire and asked the power utility, "What do you know about this phenomena and uh, what you have done?" for it and the answer was obvious we don't know anything we haven't done nothing and this is added to the stress and the FERC order issued this order 779 in 2013 and asked NERC which is North American Electric Reliability Corporation to develop the standard with high uh, priority and uh, as urgent uh, act. Uh, NERC, is, uh, NERC is an organization that uh, developed the standard for industry. Uh, unlike the IEEE, we have IEEE, IEEE which is a, a basically abbreviation for Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, uh, is very famous. Uh, it's basically the reference number one in the world for the publication and the standards, etc. But the standard that IEEE develops is uh, mainly used for a reference. Uh, there is no obligation to follow them. But NERC is a, a standard-oriented standard developer, uh, industry uh, standard developer. So uh, all the industry should uh, and uh, must follow this standard and be complied with. So NERC developed these two standards, important one, EOP10 and TPL007, one of them for operation, the other one for planning, and all the power utilities should perform uh, some studies, uh, some mitigation approach to implement, etc. And uh, this is regular. Regularly, each five, six years, they have to do those analyses and show their system uh, are immune to the GMD or solar storm effects. Uh, 
Then, uh, of course, around that time, it catch more attention. So everywhere on the basically mag magazines, uh, transaction papers, etc., there were some, uh, there were some uh, papers or articles about solar storms, as you see here from, uh, let's say, IEEE, like electrification is a, a spectrum to the Na National Geographic and the other journals. And they gain momentum to uh, at least uh, give more information to public, to the technical bodies and the parties to uh, develop more methods and uh, tools, etc. cetera. Uh, the stand new standards were developed. One of them is this one, which is IEEE again. Uh, some commercial developers, software developers started to develop some uh, tools for that. Uh, and before that, there was no sign of such tool in the commercial softwares. And uh, all these software started developing this. And there are these are some just examples. Uh, NERC uh, basically at the time to around 2013, uh, because in Hydro One, we were a kind of pioneer in this uh, research before the other uh, industry and software companies or the, those developers start working on this, we developed in-house uh, tools and softwares. Uh, and uh, due to that, NERC was interested to uh, at least use it and uh, make it available to public, to the power utilities. And this is uh, basically a screenshot of that web, uh, website, uh, putting these uh, tools that we developed. And uh, this one is also available even right now, and uh, it's public and everyone can use it for the assessment of geomagnetic disturbance on their systems, power systems. Now let's look at uh, more detail in the geomagnetic disturbance, solar storms. So uh, if we, let's say, want to compare sun with earth, you know that the uh, sun is huge. And so it's much bigger than earth. And when they, it has some activities like this solar flare, etc., it's again much larger than earth. Uh, and if you look at the right side here, this is just a short video, uh, which is recorded basically as CME, coronal mass ejection from sun. And uh, here, this, this circle is basically, this is just a barrier uh, to avoid uh, sound. Uh, and uh, for us, it will be available to see the crown of the sun here. So uh, the sun itself is here behind this. And if we look at this video, this is sun, basically that explosion and releasing a huge amount of plasma and uh, charged particles toward the uh, little outer space. And if that one is toward the earth, we will have problem. Uh, and uh, you see the, again, huge amount of uh, charged cloud is sending out. So uh, this is what happens. When we have a uh, coronal mass ejection, uh, these charged particles basically move toward the earth if this is directed to the earth. And we know that around the earth, we have magnetic field. This magnetic field, uh, which is uh, basically forming magnetosphere around the earth, they are DC magnetic field. And uh, the field is protecting earth from uh, entering uh, harmful uh, rays and uh, uh, let's say, particles, maybe uh, different type of particles entering the atmosphere and threatening the life on the Earth. So it's a, a useful shield around the Earth. But because this is DC, we don't see any uh, induced voltage anywhere, and uh, we don't see any specific or a strange, let's say, phenomenon. But once we have this coronal mass ejection, uh, this huge amount of charged particles uh, which has high speed. It's not the speed of light, but this is one, maybe uh, a fraction of that. It typically takes half a day to one and a half day to reach air uh, as compared with eight minutes, for instance. But they are ions and this is heavy charge uh, particles. And when it hits the magnetosphere and the magnetic field, due to the disturbance that it caused to this uh, DC field, uh, based on Faraday law, when we have a change of magnetic field, we have to expect induced voltage somewhere. And when the charged particles and ion 
goes and get trapped in this magnetic field, that induced voltage due to the shock that it apply on this field, we have a derivative, non-zero derivative of magnetic field. And due to that, uh, we have driving voltage, electromotive force driving those ions. And this one cause a uh, flow of uh, uh, current, electric current in a layer which is called ionosphere, which is closer to the earth. And it's roughly 80 to 120 uh, kilometer above the ground level. And uh, this one is, is the start of those problem on the earth and terrestrial, let's say infrastructure, etc. So this is another video showing uh, animation, basically showing what happens. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, this is the sun again, uh, explosion, massive explosion happens, coronal mass ejection happens now. And this huge cloud, let's say, uh, is coming and hits the, like, the magnetic field around the Earth. These charged particles get trapped in the magnetic field. And uh, that induced voltage push and uh, basically drain all these charges into the Earth ionosphere. And these blue lines that you see here, is basically those uh, flow of the current in the ionosphere, which reach uh, some million amperes of current. It's huge. And uh, basically, it depends on the severity, of course, of the storm. Uh, and uh, this one uh, called uh, electrojet. When we, uh, yeah, okay. So now let's look at the uh, solar cycle because uh, if we, for instance, ask uh, how often uh, we have to expect those phenomena to happen, it's basically follow uh, this pattern, which is following basically the solar cycle. And solar cycle is the cycle of activities on the sun's surface, which is counted or measured by sunspot number. Uh, this is the recorded number of sunspots, and this is the average level of that SSN, average sunspot number over the years, starting from uh, 19th century, coming to, let's say, around this time that I have record for that. Of course, there is update for this, but uh, the pattern showing 11 year cycle. So each 11 year, we expect this goes to the peak, goes to the minimum, et cetera, and come back. And, uh, if you want to see what happens, this is another video. This is actual record for different years showing this is quiet, then start that going toward the peak activities now. So year by year, you see more activities around sun and uh, they are all just uh, dark spots. And these are all the activity explosions, the line of magnetic field uh, and uh, you see, uh, highly active surface, then come back gradually to the minimum by lowering the number of sunspot here. And uh, yeah, so this one is just very bad. You see eruptions here and uh, explosions like here. And uh, this is the quiet again as year of 2005, for instance, that cycle. Uh, so this is uh, what happens actually. Uh, let's go forward and uh, again. Now, if we want to compare with the past events that happened before, uh, we have uh, two major events, the recorded events. Uh, one of them is the uh, 1859 storm, which is called Carrington event uh, due to the name of the Carrington, uh, a British astronomer, astronomer captured, recorded that uh, and reported that event. Uh, and that one is the strongest recorded uh, solar storm to date. And after that, we had 1921 storm. Uh, that one also is strong, uh, wasn't strong, but uh, a little bit weaker than the Carrington event. But if you look at, for instance, the period that they happen, this is uh, happening uh, in these two cycle that uh, is even lower than the average sunspot number. So it means 
the strong storm may happen anytime, basically. It doesn't mean if we have maximum activity, we have to expect necessarily the strongest solar storm because there is always a kind of randomness here. And uh, uh, so it depends on many, uh, let's say, parameters. Some, most of them are unknown yet. This is like the other events like earthquake, anything that we can predict, but uh, to some extent accuracy, right? And uh, we cannot, uh, let's say, predict well in advance what happens, etc. And this is the same thing, basically. Uh, this is very famous event, which is closer to us and uh, in terms of time, and uh, it caused the hydrocubic blackout, complete hydrocubic system go went to blackout. And uh, the, due to that the storm, this is just five minutes after starting the storm. Uh, hydrocubic completely went into the blackout. The spotted here areas or the places that malfunctioning and problem abnormalities were reported across US and Canada. And this is simulation of electrojet for that event. And after, uh, uh, well, five minutes from start, and this picture is the actual, a real picture taken by a satellite from that electro jet. And as you see, it's uh, above northern US and southern Canada. Uh, so this one is uh, basically simulated here, and this is very nice real picture of the effect and uh, basically phenomenon. After 30 minutes from the start of the storm, uh, more problems were also reported across the US and Canada. And the electrojet uh, became basically bigger and uh, covered more areas around the globe. And uh, so it caused the other problems elsewhere. And so th this phenomena, again, because this is affecting the whole earth, not uh, just one region, let's say one province or even one country. This is a pro global problem. And during that 1989 hydrocubic blackout, we had these basically observations. Uh, Aurora, which is basically northern light, which is supposed to be visible in higher latitude uh, regions of the uh, Earth, let's say, around the world, the, that aurora was visible even in Florida and Cuba and Caribbean. So that far south, those uh, aurora was observed. Nine million people in Quebec were, uh, were basically without power for more than eight hours. The estimated cost due to that was $300 million. Uh, this is a kind of short-term cost estimate. Uh, the other uh, basically references and papers I have seen in long term, they estimated a double of this or even more uh, due to the effects on the supply chain, economy, and all of those things. So the cost could be higher. New York power and New England power pool lost 1300 megawatt because of hydrocubic co collapse. Uh, you know that basically the power systems are interconnected together. So one problem to one system is a spread to basically uh, other site and uh, neighboring systems and cause a uh, cascaded problem. New England power lost 10 of its 24 capacitor banks. Salem nuclear power plant in New Jersey lost a step up transformer, which is shown here. So this huge transformer was completely failed. Uh, and this is just a melted part of its uh, low voltage winding. This winding is rated for uh, 3000 amps. This is nuclear power plant. And this is just one phase of that uh, basically uh, power generation unit. Just behind this wall, we have a huge generator, more than a thousand megawatt generator. And this is just one phase of that transformer. Across the USA, uh, 200 transformer and protection and control problems were reported. Uh, so the span of uh, problem is huge. And now if uh, we compare the footprint of 1921 uh, super storm with this 1989, uh, 
the 1921 is much stronger. And if you see here, the comparison between the electrodes. So the red one is 1989. And this border shown here in white, this one will be the basically footprint of the electrojet for 1921 storm. And you see the electrojet itself comes uh, even to the Mexico area and Caribbean, etc. So you see this is huge uh, electrojet and the currents. This is just uh, the figure showing uh, different activities, different phenomena and the consequences of the phenomenon on the different part of the basically uh, systems and technologies. Solar flares cause uh, basically ionization of upper atmosphere and uh, eventually uh, impact uh, the radio blackout, uh, maybe railway systems and uh, uh, some communication based systems, let's say. But coronal mass ejection, which is stronger, uh, cause magnetic storm and they may create geomagnetically induced current in the system. Ionospheric storm, ionospheric scintillation, which is happening for the, again, the satellite signals, mainly the radio signals. Uh, and the, the effect eventually will be on the power grid and railway system, uh, global uh, navigation satellite systems, uh, etc. And the radio storm or radiation storms will affect the electronics and again on the communications and do disruption uh, in the other systems. But uh, this one, which I forgot to uh, basically mention is that the same phenomena is normal, just normal natural phenomena. And that one is solar wind. The northern uh, light that we see and we observe is due to exactly, let's say it's very similar phenomena. So they are solar wind. This is again, charged particles sent to the earth and they cause those beautiful northern lights, etc. But uh, again, solar wind, like the normal wind, but it it gets stronger, it's called a storm, it's solar wind becomes solar storm. So uh, the origin is almost the same. Now, if we look at the society and the modern society, let's say, uh, all this infrastructure and systems are interconnected. And uh, first of all, uh, will be power system itself, which is more vulnerable, one of the most vulnerable systems to a solar storm, everything and the other technology, most of the technologies rely on power. If we don't have power, we don't have the other technologies operating. And uh, these are just, uh, uh, let's say a kind of a very high level uh, overview of the interaction of these infrastructure and systems together. So power systems, we have on the other hand, the effect on the oil and gas, oil and gas uh, in turns affect the others, basically like uh, for instance, emergency services uh, and uh, or more importantly, for instance, communications. If the communication, first of all, is directly affected, due to loss of power, secondary and indirectly also communication system will be affected. And when we don't have communication, so emergency services will be problem, emergency call center and fire station, which is basically both based on the communication, et cetera, uh, or even availability of the other, uh, let's say water maybe also, uh, everything will be affected and they are interconnected. The government services uh, will be affected. Banking and finance definitely will be affected. Uh, ATM machines and the other systems will not be working. And so the people basically in the society will be suffering from multiple, let's say, uh, point of views. And uh, so uh, the impact of a solar storm is not limited to just one power system technology or so. Uh, it affects many technologies in the society. Uh, and this is just very nice uh, example of a relatively mild and let's say a moderate uh, solar storm. In Halloween night of 2003, which is also famous as Halloween storm, uh, of 2003, a relatively mild solar storm happened. And what you see here is the consequences of that. So uh, starting from the left, uh, we had some flights. 
uh, and the route restrictions of those flights due to geomagnetic disturbance impact on communications. So numerous uh, polar uh, flights rerouted, uh, power plant reduced, power generation due to geomagnetic disturbance to provide and uh, uh, create a room for the equipment because of the stress of uh, geomagnetic disturbance, they want to lower the power to give more room and re relief to the equipment to withstand that stress. There are a number of places on the earth that oil field services company reported several cases of survey instrument interference and uh, they had problems with those instruments and measurements. We had a widespread high frequency outage over African continent. The whole Africa was blackout of radio. Uh, GPS core uh, problems we had in the Northern Europe. Uh, we had power outage in Sweden. Uh, the effect on high frequencies were in uh, Australia and Asia here, uh, and we had outage there. Uh, a huge power transformer damage in South Africa. Uh, some ships had a navigation problem and they restored to backup system due to loss of GPS signal. Uh, some uh, satellites had problem. Uh, for instance, Japanese data related satellite went into safe mode and took over a week to recover. And here on top, you see the problems happened in the space. Uh, 18 of 34 NASA air and space science missions impacted, flare damage, Mars Odyssey probe, uh, power down of Canadian robotic arm on International sta uh, Space Station, solar cell damage, and all of these things, loss of Japanese satellite. Uh, these are our consequences of that relatively mild storm. And over 130 hours of high frequency communication blackout in Antarctic. And uh, so uh, you see this one is just a globe uh, footprint, global footprint of the uh, solar storm. The other technologies that at least uh, was not there in that uh, the previous slide is railway system and transportation. Uh, because of the long track running in the air on the earth surface, we have uh, induced voltage in the earth and this cause flow of current uh, on the track. And uh, this one is also connected to electrical system depending on this is AC, DC. So it creates more problem. These are just uh, uh, some, let's say observation and the recorded events uh, in the past uh, in the railway systems. So maybe we have to start from the most recent one. Uh, of course, after this, we had more problem, but for this reference, it was up to 2004. So in Russia, Sweden, the USA, UK, uh, we had this problem. So signal suggesting false blockage in the railway tracks in Russia with random behavior of signal due to the fluctuation of this uh, basically induced voltage, uh, these electronic systems may get problem and the false uh, alarming signaling and all of those problems and coming in and out of that mode. This is why we have random behavior. Unexplained anomalies in uh, railway circuits were observed. Railway circuits described false uh, tracks blockage with high geomagnetic storm activities. Unexplained anomalies in railway circuits in Russia were reported. Geomagnetic storm disturbed automatic railway system triggering several uh, signals by reporting with false obstruction of railway track. So uh, basically this one has uh, uh, the geomagnetic disturbance has two major eff effects in signal on signaling and uh, in the let's say uh, optimistic uh, view we can say okay we have a, a green situation but turn to red. So the minimum effect will be that there is no obstruction on the track, but the train should stop, she cannot proceed. And this causes a delay, delay for almost all trains. And uh, at least the schedule will be completely messed up and uh, uh, the delays and that one definitely can be translated then to the dollar damage, uh, I mean, loss, financial loss, etc. But the worst case will be the opposite. If we have a red situation, but it turns to green and it shows everything is okay, 
which is not okay. So the chance of crash and accident will happen. And uh, so this is dangerous and need to be addressed. Uh, how frequent? Uh, when was the last storm, let's say? Again, this is a problem and uh, this is a general question. So, well, this is good, but uh, what happened uh, in the, let's say, last events and uh, what is the nearest one? In February 2022, SpaceX witnessed the destructive power of the sun when a geomagnetic storm destroyed up to 40 brand new, brand, brand new Starlink satellites worth over $50 million shortly after deployment. So they launched 49 satellites, Starlink, 40 of them uh, had probably destroyed basically. Uh, one day after they launched, uh, the solar storm happened and uh, these 40 satellites gradually drag, uh, got dragged and uh, basically fall into the atmosphere because solar storm heat up the upper atmosphere. It increased the density of at upper atmosphere. It increased the drag on the satellite and satellites slowly uh, slow down, basically. Gradually slow down and enter the atmosphere and burn up. And this happened for 4D brand new Starlink satellites in February 2022. And we have several radio blackouts in Africa, uh, Europe and Africa, and Africa and Middle East in these day, uh, months, basically February, August, and September 2022. And uh, I don't know, uh, it seems I don't have too much time, but I will go uh, quickly over the impact on the power system, let's say, as the basically the most vulnerable and the key element in new or modern life. Uh, and this is backbone of the technologies. Uh, so when we have uh, ionosphere current, this current is of very low frequency, less than even 0 0.1 millihertz, up to 30 millihertz, but mostly in uh, around one or fraction of millihertz. When we have this current electrojet uh, in ionosphere, it creates magnetic field and it links with transmission lines with the ground. And uh, because the all the power systems, high voltage systems are connected to ground. Uh, and we, have, we must connect the high voltage neutral point to the ground to be able to control the over voltage in the system. And uh, due to this ground connection, this substation with some hundred kilometers, let's say, uh, substation away from that, this distance uh, we have induced voltage due to this electrojet in the ionosphere. Due to this potential difference between the two stations, we have a flow of a current in the transmission line and transformers, which is called geomagnetically induced current, GIC. And uh, this one is the start of all consequences in power system. So this one just uh, was animation of that electrojet, which is uh, from NASA. Uh, Goddard uh, Space Flight Center. And uh, when we have that uh, basically uh, current electrojet, uh, we can view the induced voltage as a DC because this is very low frequency, it's close to DC, which is also called quasi DC. And this uh, flows the geomagnetically induced current GIC in the system. And the, the value of the induced voltage, which is the start of all this evaluation, is or should be coming from a multiple layer Earth model. And this is why the geophysics is coming in the picture. Uh, we need to know all this structure of the ground layers, the conductivities, depths, etc. And when we have the transformer under GIC, we have a spiky current of a uh, transformer, which should be sinusoidal under normal case. This is not sinusoidal. We have some, basically all sorts of harmonics flowing in the system. And this one caused those problems. And uh, if I want to go to all the details, it takes, uh, basically needs another presentation to discuss all the effects on power system. But bottom line, which is uh, happening uh, in the power system, more expected, at least happen in hydro -Quebec. Uh, case uh, was the blackout. Uh, they lost basically a species and capacitor bank which provide reactive power to the system. At the same time, those capacitor banks were tripped 
due to the, those harmonics. So at the same time that we need reactive power support, we lose reactive power sources. And these cause voltage control problem and power grid collapse. And this is exactly happened during the hydro Quebec blackout. Uh, again, coming back to this to see what would be the catastrophe due to the failure of this or such huge transformers. First of all, uh, we have typically very few spares available for large power transformer because they are not supposed to fail every week or every month. The, this is why we have in all power grids uh, or utilities, we have very few because they are very large and they are very expensive. Each transformer, at least like this in this size, at least, well, this is more than $10 million. Uh, and so this is why they are huge and they are costly. And more importantly, manufacturing uh, perform uh, basically offshore mainly. Uh, the lead time for these uh, devices uh, or uh, trans large transformer are more than a year typically. So assume that due to solar storm, if we lose multiple transformer of this size at once. So uh, basically replacing this transformer will take long time. And this is why under solar is a severe solar storm, we expect long recovery time. And uh, to give you some, let's say, uh, sense of what happened to that large transformer, the transformer that should be the stand, which is designed for 3000 amperes of this winding, which is melted down. Uh, this one is rated 3000 amps, just the GIC of 30 amps, 33 amps, was enough to destroy this transformer. Because transformer is an AC device, not DC device. They have almost zero or very low with stand capability for DC. Uh, we have the other effects on generators. We had during those uh, uh, hydro quick blackout event, we had alarming in Ontario power system generators, and they couldn't trip, the relay could not trip because they couldn't catch this phenomenon. Uh, and the study or a study shows the stress is very high while the standard relay and monitoring system cannot see. This is the Wiedestein level. All the existing method measure this while the stress is this, well beyond the standard, uh, standard maximum levels. Cap banks will be uh, over, overloaded with harmonics and will be, will be tripped. And the protection system will fail to detect this fault if fault happens on their GIC because there is no history. The design, the protection is not designed for that situation. And this is blind, uh, blind to this type of fault. And if you want to see what happens for a transformer, if there is a fault, but it's not detected, this is a fault, it's not detected by relay. It's there melting everything. And this is the final situation for a transformer or power system if protection system is blind to the faults. So uh, we have other effects on renewable systems. Uh, they are highly distorted. Again, we have control protection problems. The way that we can, due to lack of time, unfortunately, I have to move fast. Uh, for the system, if we want to do the study, we need to go over, start with the ionospheric uh, electrojet current, then go to uh, geophysics, uh, basically boundaries and uh, uh, field and uh, model all these layers with different conductivity. And this is basically geomagnetic disturbance analysis is interdisciplinary, uh, basically research. It's not only done in one field. Uh, we have to do some uh, fitting, uh, preparing in frequency domain, then convert it to time domain based on, based on different structure of the uh, earth layer. Uh, for instance, you see the transfer function of Quebec is different from Ontario, different from BC. Uh, and they have, of course, magnitude phase angle will be different. The, the induced voltage that we are talking about, for instance, Carrington event, uh, which is the strongest one, is expected to be around uh, 10 volt, 12 volt 
per kilometer induced voltage. Here is a hydroequivocal. Less than two volt per kilometer was enough to completely uh, uh, knock down the uh, power grid. So uh, this is why in, the, let's say, modern life, because at the older time in Carrington 1815 something or 59, we didn't have power system. We didn't have uh, the technologies. But due to the today technologies, we are more, more and much more vulnerable to solar storm these days. And so a small, let's say, a power uh, the solar storm can uh, create many damage to many systems. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, the mitigation approach uh, is uh, purely basically power system stuff. Uh, the, uh, this is, uh, let's say, Ontario Grid Control Center that you see here. The program that we developed is running right now in this control room and the operators are taking action based on what they see from this program. And uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I stop here uh, uh, this is the reference used and thank you for your attention and uh, I'll be more than happy to take the any question thank you thank you so much Dr. Zara that that was fascinating uh, I teach a little bit about geomagnetic storms in a disaster risk management class and uh, <laughs> obviously you. this was so enlightening and will be my pleasure extremely helpful for me. We do have a few minutes for questions and perhaps we could even extend it uh, closer into the, the end of the hour uh, with the permission of uh, Ira and Dr. Wu. Um, first, uh, if no one received my message, please, if you have a question for Dr. Zara, please type it into the chat uh, or question and answer window um, and we will, we will answer as many questions as possible. Uh, Dr. Rozdilski, would you like to ask your question yourself? Uh, yes, uh, 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 thank you. Um, my, my um, uh, uh, Dr. Zari, uh, thank, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, my question uh, involves, um, I guess, the back end of what happens. Um, albeit my um, electrical engineering knowledge is um, somewhat limited in this respect, uh, but you mentioned in the uh, Montreal um, 1989 storm, it was a five minute storm that caused the damage. Uh, my question is what happens on the uh, back end? Does the induced current create the damage and just fade away and then things get basically back to normal in terms uh, of uh, current flow? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for this question. Uh, basically the, the event itself, it was not just five minutes. Uh, when the solar storm happens, it's typically taking about two, three hours. Uh, but uh, of course, the, around that peak activity is very important when the maximum stress is applied to the system. Uh, uh, what happened exactly during that storm was that the GIC happens and flow in, uh, in the flows in the system, enters the transformers, saturate all the transformers. Uh, when the transformer is saturated, it draws reactive power, means they are. The, causing the drop of voltage. Uh, when they cause uh, that voltage drop, we need reactive power to inject into the system and boost the voltage up. But capacitor banks, which are the source of reactive power, were also tripped out due to, again, harmonics. Secondary issue of the GIC. GIC caused transformer saturation. Transformer saturation create a high magnitude harmonics. High magnitude harmonics pushed into the capacitor banks, overloaded them, and the protection, overload protection of the capacitor banks take the capacitors out of service. And this is why at the same time exactly that we need reactive power to boost voltage up, and uh, 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 prevent voltage collapse, we lose reactive power sources. And then why one, one, the system collapsed, the system trip, different parts, generators were out of service and we had less and less sources to support voltage. And finally, all the system collapsed. This is what happened. Thank you. Did, does that answer your question, Dr. Rostilski? Uh, yeah, yes, it does. Thank you. Thank 
Dr. Wu had a question. Um, it has to do with prediction. Can we predict the solar cycle? And my follow-up question to that, Dr. Zari, would be, is that what the people at the Ontario Con Grid Control Centre are doing? Are they monitoring and making predictions? Yeah, the prediction is coming from NRCAN. We have a geomagnetism laboratory. Uh, and they are basically the, for instance, the tool that we developed at Hydro One uh, had fit from that uh, magnetometers that they have in the lab. So they measure the magnetic field changes and uh, we, on, uh, in real time, we get basically those signals and uh, do the analysis in that program, calculate all of these things, induced voltage, flow of GIC, voltages, et cetera, reactive power losses. And uh, based on that, uh, operator will react to that. But the prediction is uh, basically, uh, it's uh, mainly, let's say, astrophysic uh, job. Uh, in the US, NASA uh, is the main source of those activities and prediction of uh, solar activities. They have a few satellites uh, always continuously monitoring sun. And if uh, any storm, any activity happened on the sun surface, uh, which is coming to the earth, they detect that. And uh, alarm, let's say, or at least let the uh, centers on the earth know about the coming storm. But that one, even with that uh, type of prediction, we don't have too much time. We have, I think, maximum around an hour or so to prepare for that uh, solar storm, you know. Okay, so with that, I want to lead to Hyun Wu Ki's question. Um, would you like to uh, state your question yourself? Because it has to do with what Dr. Zari just said. Um, well, I will happily ask the question, it has to do with the lead time. And if we uh, have an hour, if we can expect the, the impacts, the potential impacts, is there a possibility for us to just disconnect the transformers momentarily? Yeah, this is also a solution, but uh, this is not a good solution because uh, the problem is that when we have induced voltage in power system, the current wants to flow and find a uh, let's say path to go mm -hmm. right if we take this transformer out the total gic for instance if we have two transformer and we take one of them out the old gic goes to one transformer and okay. make the operating condition of that transformer even worse i feel like what you're saying is we're just displacing the energy uh, yeah exactly so we are directing gic to uh, a very few transform make this situation even worse sometimes. This is why we need a global, because I have a slide here, but we didn't have time. Mm -hmm. We have to do a global optimization to put GIC blockers in the system to block those current. But mm -hmm. due to exactly the same problem, if we block one way, the total GIC goes to the other ways and make the other areas situation worse. This is why we have to do global optimization to mitigate and reduce the magnitude of those GIC in a very optimized way. But the optimization on a huge power grid, which is uh, basically the footprint is at least a province. For the example that we do for, we did with 118 bus power system, it took 25 hours with 12 processor core computer, something like that, which is just a toy example. If we go to real power system, for instance, Ontario has more than a thousand bus. So the number of iterations and all time exponentially will increase. And so we, this is why we need much better and efficient optimization method, campus simulation methods. So we are uh, just in, in fancy stage for GIC. Dr. Zari, this has been incredible. I wish we had another hour to, to talk because I have myself alone so many more questions for you. Unfortunately, we have reached the end of the hour. And uh, so I would like to take one final opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Zari, for being here with us. My pleasure. Today. Thanks and a lot. I'll, I'll pass the floor back over to either Dr. Wu or Ira. Oh, uh, Dr. Spinney, I just want to thank you for moderating uh, mm -hmm. the session and uh, option, of course, for a wonderful thank uh, you talk. And uh, I think I want to thank everybody for, for joining us. And 
uh, I wish I would like to take the opportunity to 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 send our best wishes for for a holiday safe and joyful holiday season and for the best of the new year. Thanks a lot, Jan and Jen. Thank you so much, and thanks everyone for joining us in this presentation. And uh, happy holidays! Yeah, thank you, everyone. I, I I also would like to invite everyone for the. And uh, next talk, thank you, Dr. Zari, for your uh, informative talk lecture today. Uh, our next lecture will be on January 19. It's the third um, Thursday. It's it will be delivered by Dr. Jason Von Medding, Associate Professor in the University of Florida for the Rinker School of Construction Management. He will now share insights into the development of a new theory of vulnerability for disaster. Uh, studies to reflect this nuance and also unpack a recently published work on how vulnerability is securitized in the case of poverty, prison, and mitigation, uh, migration, and uh, homelessness. So we will, um, we are inviting you also for that talk. And with that, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you.